Hello, and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud. This is a little blue book, and it's now missing its cover. But it is titled, A History of Sculpture, and it is written by Murray Sheehan, M.A. And it was written, copyrighted in, I believe, 1924, but let's check to make sure. Let's see, these pages are fragile. Yep, 1924. This is part four. And we left off at the bottom of page 30. And we begin with a new chapter, The Renaissance at Siena. Since mention has already been made of the work of Nicola Pisano and his followers in Siena and elsewhere, we may as well take up the Sienese sculptors first, although, first, although they were not as important as those of Florence, that great center of all art in the Renaissance. As we saw, Nicola Pisano was to the ancients, oh, went to the ancients for inspiration, to such an extent that one might easily mistake some of his base reliefs for late Roman carving or the sculpture from some early Christian sarcophagus. But this movement toward the antique bore but little fruit, and his followers were more Gothic than classic. About a century after the death of Nicola, however, Jacopo della Quercia was born in Siena, 1374-1438. He, too, was Gothic in his earlier work, but later he developed a balanced sense of rigorous movement, unlike Gothic figures, and moreover, he portrayed the nude, a step in realism, which was never fully taken during Gothic times. His works are today to be found only in Siena and in Bologna. When we come to study the work of Michelangelo, we shall not be surprised to find that he, is inf that he was influenced by the sturdy figures of the, and base reliefs of Della Caricias. There were other sculptors in Siena during the Renaissance, but they need not stop us here. The Renaissance at Florence. Now we enter into the very stronghold of the Italian Renaissance, where the majority of its masterpieces and sculpture were created, and where they remain to this day. Thus, although its supreme paintings may be seen in scores of museums all over the world, one must journey to Florence to see its greatest statues. And the trip is worth the making. Personally, I should change. Personally, I should change the old adage and say, "See Florence and die." It will be remembered that Andre Pisano made a pair of doors for the baptistry at Florence. These were finished in 1336 and were distinctly Gothic in ornament and in the general feeling of their composition. A hundred years later, the Florentines wished to add another set of doors to their baptistry. And for this purpose, they instituted a competition in which took part not only Della Curcia, but also Brunella, Brunella Shai, famous as the architect of the Great Dome to the Cathedral of Florence, and Lorenzo Gilberti, 1378-1465, who won the competition. His doors are still standing and offer what are really the first Renaissance sculptures. It was stipulated in the competition that the outlines to the panels must be the same in the door as in the door of Nicola, and thus these remain Gothic. But there is an added sense of freedom in the figures, and particularly the designs between the panels, as much more like that fine sense of decorative art which was pointed out as being characteristic of Roman work. But Gilbert, Gilberti's masterpiece was yet to be done, and it also was to adorn this same octagonal sculpture in Florence, structure in Florence. The last 25 years of his life were given to the creation of another, another set of bronze doors, which Michelangelo declared were worthy to be the gateway of paradise. They consist of 10 great square panels with a rich border of medallions and figures, and in them Gilberti used a free sense of perspective, 
which frankly is more pertinent to painting than to sculpture, and yet which here produced superb results. These doors have had tremendous effect on succeeding schools of artists, not always with the happiest of results, as witnessed the doors to our own Capitol building at Washington. Not so parad paradisical and therefore more Newman, yeah, therefore more human, was the work of Lucia della Robbia, 1399 to 1482, whose admirable creations in marble, including the well-known panels of musical boys and in bronze, are generally overshadowed by those charming creations of his in glazed and colored terracotta, which in their cheery colors are among the loveliest things we have inherited from the Renaissance. His nephew, Andrea della Robbia, 1437-1528, carried on this latter work, perhaps his best-known works being the series of Bambina, or Standing Babies, for the Foundlings Hospital in Florence. Several of Andrea's sons continued the process into the 16th century. Donatello and his followers But perhaps... The most thoroughly engaging figure of the Florentine Renaissance is that of Donatello, about 1386 to 1466, who with his numerous followers has extended a tremendous influence on sculptors since his day. He united in his work an exciting sense of realism with a sense of form gained from study of the ancients. Although many of his works purport to be religious decorations, they are filled with a thoroughly pagan sense of the joy of life and the delight in the beautiful human body, such as had hardly been achieved since the days of Greece. He brought into religious sculpture those charming figures of dancing infants, which he claimed were cherubs, but which differ hardly at all from the frank cupids of classic art. It is but a step from his graceful... little angel with a tambourine, or his lithe young David wearing a fetching spring hat and boots and nothing else to his adorable Cupid in trousers, all of them in Florence. His portraits were such rare achievements of individualization as had not been done since Roman times, and his equestrian statue of oh, Gautamalte, Gatta Milate in Padua was the first great statue on horseback since classic times. That Dantotello was capable of sacrificing the merely graceful and pretty in the name of a higher beauty is manifest in his bald-headed Zucone on the Florence Campanelli and in the rigorous St. George, which have both been quite rightly looked upon as masterpieces of modern architectural sculpture. Here he enters into a stark realism that is truthfulness in the highest sense, whether we admire the subjects or not. They hardly seem the handiwork of the same man that could devise the elegant architectural features of the Florence choir loft, replete with classical detail. Among the followers of Dantotello was the Cid de Siderlo di San de Silero di Settenagno, I don't know, 1428 to 1464, with some beautiful small reliefs, statues and busts, principally depicting the same child types as delighted his master Donatello. He too must be studied in Florence, where are also several very fine architectural works, such as tombs, etc. Veracciochi, 1435 to 1488, was another follower of Donatello, equally great as painter and sculptor, to have been the teacher of Leonardo da Vinci and Lorenzo di Credi, and others besides, painting such works as the lovely Virgin in the National Gallery in London, would have brought him on dying fame, even if he had not created what is by many considered the greatest equestrian statue in the world the Colonnai in Venice. Florence teems with his work, for he was a favorite of the Medici family. His, um, his almost cocky figure of David in the <coughs> excuse me, Bargelio in Florence shows that he had caught the same secret of vivacity 
which makes Donatello the hero of most modern sculptors. Every inch of these works seems alive and quivering. Mino de Fislio, 1431-1484, was the creator of some of the most beautifully chaste architectural details of his time. These included tabernacles, tombs, etc., in which classic elements were combined in what has come to be known as a thoroughly Renaissance manner. As a matter of fact, the influence of Mino in this direction was very great, since he worked in Rome as well as in Florence, and thus in the following century his sculpture continued to exert its power, when Rome had become the great artistic center through the influence of the popes. Benedetto de Maggiano, 1442-1497, had the same architectural power as Mino, as in shown by his masterly pulpit in Santa Croix in Florence, and he showed perhaps even greater power as a figure sculptor. The altar of the church in Mente Olivierto at Naples is considered his masterpiece, although perhaps together with most of his fellow followers of Don Totello, most people will feel the greatest attraction toward this his wonderful portrait bust. The same holds true also of the other notable names among this group. Antonio Rosalino, 1427-1478. to 1478. Next chapter, Michelangelo. And now we must leave the blessed 15th century of the early Renaissance and tackle the 16th century of the high development of Renaissance sculpture. Even as we found that the early Renaissance was centered around three main figures, Ghiberti, Della, Robbia, and Dantitello, not to mention the pre-Renaissance dawn of Nicola Pisano, born a century too soon, so here in the later epoch we shall also have three great names to conjure with. The first of these is Michelangelo Bernari Bunaroti. Boy, I'm butchering that last name. 1475 to 1564. Generally known by his first two names, Michelangelo was painter, poet, and architect, as well as sculptor. As witness his sonnets, his superb paintings in the Sistine Chapel, and his constructive work on St. Peter's at Rome. But he looked upon himself as sculptor, and always signed his name with, an, with that occupation affixed. His earliest well-known work was the Pieta in Rome, showing the Virgin with the dead Christ lying across her knees. Pardon me, knees. This he finished when only 23 years of age, and at first the authorities would not believe that so young a man could do so great a work. And it is said to, and it is hard to realize that this masterly depiction of the dead body was the work of a youth. We get a totally different feeling here from the sweet peacefulness of the earlier Renaissance. There is already a hint of that dire sorrow and troubled spirit that marked all the later work of Michelangelo, as though he were struggling to express the inexpressible attempting to cope with terrors that were too big for him. This sorrowing mother with the lifeless body of her son in her lap is more poignant than any work of the century which was just closing and marked the entrance into the new era. The Tremendous David was finished in 1504, when Michelangelo was still under 30, and then he plunged into the two great commissions which, with his painting filled the rest of his tormented life, and which he was destined to see unfinished at the time of his death. These were the tombs of Julius II in Rome and of Medicini in Florence. The vast majority of his works were meant to enter into these two structures. The heroic Moses in Rome and the two slaves in the Louvre are the best-known figures from the former project, while the statues of Giuliano and Lorenzo de Medici with the four recumbent figures of day, night, evening, and dawn, are all that reached even partial completion for the latter. In the academy, in the Bergello at Florence, you will find partially hewn blocks of marble, 
from the hand of Michelangelo, in which we still f we find still further evidence of the tortured soul that manifested itself in all his work, both painting and sculpture. Tremendous power is present in all of these, unfinished as they are, but a power that caught that could not work itself through to full fru fruition. Boy, that's a hard word, fruition. The man had early been influenced by the st sturdy work of the Jacopo della Quisiria in Bulgaria, by Dantitello, and by antique statues which the Medici, Men Medici family had gathered at Florence. The group of the Locune, that frenzied masterpiece of Hellenistic sculpture, was discovered during the lifetime of Michelangelo and exerted a great influence on him who also was interested in, a de in depicting the human form and the toils of suffering. Never, perhaps, have, the, have there been united in one man such complete mastery of technical means, which so little self-mastery of the spirit. The serenity which we found to be the distinguishing mark of the Greeks of the great 5th century B.C. is totally lacking here, which accounts perhaps for the fact that today Michelangelo is by most people felt in a more personal way than it is the work of the classic Greeks. The 20th century possesses little of serenity. Benevito Cellini The second figure of these later times was Benevito Cellini, 1500-1572, to 1572, goldsmith, bronze worker, adventurer, and diarist of the most engaging figures of the Renaissance, ornate and opulent in his rich work in gold, enamel, and jewels, which he wrought into some of the most exquisite ornaments of the Renaissance, for the de declination of kings and princes, among them France the First of France, Francis the First of France, Cellini took over into his bronzes something of the same feeling, his masterpiece, the Perseus, in the Logia del Lanzi in Florence, shows a delicacy of proportions and a fineness of finish, which, strictly speaking, belongs to the more minute art of the worker in precise metals rather than in the creator of bronze. Dantitello had been the first to employ the metal for the presentation of nudes since Roman times, and his David, mentioned before, had such had much of his same delicacy of treatment, although his Judith, standing just next to the Perseus in Florence, shows that he could work in a more solid manner. The Perseus stands on a marble base, also the work of Cellini, which shows his sense of Renaissance detail to perfection. In four niches at the base and four small bronze figures, are four small bronze figures, the whole forms one, the whole forms one of the most thoroughly pleasing works of art of this time. The same spirit is evident in the work of Jacopo Sansovino, 1487-1570, best known for his exquisite figures in the Laghetti at the base of the Campanelli of St. Marco in Venice, with which it was destroyed when the tower collapsed in 1902. There have since been rebuilt and faithful reproduction, and so some measures of their charm can still be gained. In Florence is preserved his Bacchus, a laughing figure redolent of the antiques which he so ad assiduously studied. That was another tough sentence. Giovanni da Bologna. The third notable figure of the period was Giovanni da Bologna, 1524 to 1608, a native of Doea in Flanders, D-O-U-A-I, Doea in Flanders, who had studied in Rome and whose flying mercury is everywhere known. It was cast in bronze, as were his great fountains in Florence and Bologna, although he worked also in marble, notably the two vehement groups of the rape of the Sabine woman and Hercules and Nessus in the Logia in France. He was the last great figure of Italian sculpture, which sank into a decadence in the 17th century, 
from which it has never really revived. <coughs> Pardon me. Thus, we may say that in two centuries, Italy had swung from Gothic sculpture to the height of the Renaissance and was then ready to topple into downward tendencies. The 15th century had seen the radiant charm of the early Renaissance with Gilberti, Donatello, and Della Robbia at the forefront. The 16th century witnessed the heyday of classical influence with Michelangelo, Cellini, and Giovanni de Bologna as its main lights, and as far as Italy is concerned, the rest is pretty much silence. And I think we'll stop there and we'll pick up with the next chapter called the French Renaissance. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you in part five.